Welcome back, horror fam, to day 24 of our Halloween countdown. There's been a lot of talk recently about AI taking everyone's jobs away, so I decided to throw some prompts at an AI writer to see what kind of horror stories we can expect from this new technology. So without further ado, let's begin. This story is called, The Cabin in the Attic. Ooh, spooky. Ahem. We're all sitting around the living room and eating some Halloween candy. Daddy gets out a tape recorder and asks us, what kind of story do we want him to tell? The kids vote on which type of story we want Daddy to tell us. We vote unanimously for the one where he takes us into the attic of our house and scares the pants off of us. <laughs> Daddy gets on the table and sits cross-legged and tells us to hold hands. He says, In this story, we'll be going to a place where nobody can hear us. Just the four of us. Wait, four? There we go. He asks us if we can go to the attic. The kids start yelling, No! Daddy says, Well, don't worry. It won't hurt. And besides, I'll protect you. I'll watch your backs. Just trust me, okay? We start to say no, but Daddy puts on a funny voice and starts talking to us. It's time to go into the attic. Let's get ready. He hands each of us a flashlight and leads us to the attic door. As we open the door, we see the most disgusting spider web ever. We shine the flashlight around and notice there are dead bugs everywhere. Daddy points out a little black and white mouse that is running across the floor. There are spiders everywhere. Daddy says that it's okay. You can touch them if you want to. They're not dangerous. Then he started. I lived in an old house in town. When I was 13, my older sister would tell me the things she found in the attic and about things she saw up there. I was scared, but I didn't believe her, so I decided to go see for myself. I snuck out of my room and went up the stairs. My mom knew I had left my room, but that didn't matter. She didn't see me leave. Then a black cat ran across my path. I was just about to call out to it and pet it when it suddenly leapt on my shoulders. I felt a cold hand on my neck and realized I was standing in front of a cabin in the attic. A shadow figure with a hooded cape stood in front of the cabin door and began staring at me. I was too scared to look up at him. Tell us your name, the man said. I looked up at him and blurted out, my name is Thomas. The shadow moved closer to me and said, Tell us your age. Mm, I'm four, I replied. No. How old are you? Uh, I'm eight, I said. No, your real age, he repeated. Uh, I'll never be any older than seven, I answered. Then the man pointed a finger at me and smiled. Suddenly, there were hundreds of spiders crawling up my legs. They began to cover my body. Get out of here, I screamed. Leave me alone. I started running towards the door as quickly as I could, but when I tried to open it, it was locked. I turned around and saw the man had disappeared. I slowly walked back to the window and looked out. The black cat had vanished. The following is what I found on the internet. When a cat is caught in a room or other small space, it will often rub against the walls until it finds an exit. This is because it's seeking a way out. The next day, Mr. Smith arrived at work to find the door was locked. He knocked on the door, but no one answered. He went back to the counter where he worked. A few moments later, he felt a chill. 
Suddenly, he noticed that his hand was wet with blood. He looked down and saw the knife he was using was stuck in the floor, and blood was slowly seeping out. Mr. Smith screamed and pulled his hand out of the floor. His hand was bleeding, badly, and he was too scared to go back to work. He decided to stay at home that day and wait for his wife to arrive. It was the middle of the night, and a man was working late at a restaurant. It was a big restaurant, so he knew this place wasn't empty. He heard something outside, and saw a sponge start to wash a dirty dish. As he watched, it attacked another plate and started to eat it. He didn't know if this was real, or if he was having a dream. But he knew he didn't want to wait any longer to tell someone. He started screaming, as loud as he could hoping someone would hear him. He ran into the kitchen, grabbed a mop and a bucket of water, and started hitting the sponge with the mop. The sponge fought back, but he kept pounding until it was dead. He knew he shouldn't have screamed because he scared someone, but he was so relieved that someone else heard him. He went back to the office and told the owner what happened. The owner didn't believe him until he heard about what he did. But then he decided to call the police. The sponge had washed all the dishes, so it decided to clean up the living room. It turns on the television and is about to turn on the stereo when it notices the girl in the bedroom. She is about to go to sleep, so the sponge begins to wash her, and she wakes up. She goes to the bathroom and starts to brush her teeth when the sponge comes out of the wall and starts attacking her. Then, the sponge tries to eat her tongue. She starts running out of the bathroom. She's trying to get away. But the sponge gets into her mouth and makes her swallow. Then, the sponge starts eating through the side of her neck. And it keeps going until she's dead. Shelly was walking through a graveyard late at night. She was going to the park to meet a friend to go drinking. A sponge ran up and grabbed her from behind. It dragged her into a dark cave. The sponge kept calling out, Dinner's ready! as it dragged her down into the pit of blood where a table and chair sat, waiting for their dinner. Shelly screamed as she saw the blood seeping into the ground. Then she tried to break free. She slipped and fell. As she lay there, a little girl walked by. Shelly got up and followed her. They came to a door, and the girl knocked on it. A man opened the door. Who are you? He asked. The girl answered. I'm Mary, and this is my house. The man started to say something else, but the girl interrupted him. We're hungry. Can you take us to your kitchen, and we'll have a feast? The man looked around at the house. This house looks like a dump but it's nice enough. What kind of food would you like? A young girl, Sarah, is at her boyfriend's house watching a television show when the phone rings. A news reporter tells her that the police are saying they have solved the crime of the butcher who has murdered many young women in the last year and is currently on the loose. She says, And his name is... The news reporter is interrupted by a voice off camera, which asks her for a $20 donation to the police department. Then she says, I'm not kidding. Call 1-800-POLICE-HOMICIDE. Then she hangs up. Sarah thinks it's a prank call. She decides to call the number back. As she does, the news reporter says, 
It's Sarah. The killer is called the butcher because he cuts off the fingers of his victims and puts them in his victims' mouths. She says, We also have a picture of the butcher, which is not very good, but the police hope you'll be able to identify him. She then tells Sarah about the murder of Elizabeth Smith, whose fingers were found in her mouth, and then tells her to call the police. The picture shows a young man in a suit. A chihuahua, dressed as a ghost, strolled into the second-hand store. He walked up to the counter and placed a watch down on top of it. The proprietor looked up at the dog, then back at the watch. Why do you have that? The dog said, I'm looking for my owner. The proprietor said, Well, she's a thief, so she stole my pocket watch. The chihuahua replied, well, she took my life away, so it's only fair that I should have the watch. It looks like a normal pocket watch to me, she said. I'll just look inside to make sure. Go ahead, open it, he told her. He stood there, watching her. He wanted to help her, but he didn't know what to do. Are you really going to do it? He asked. I'll do whatever you tell me to do, she said. Well, then don't open it. There's nothing inside. It's just a watch, he said. She turned it over in her hands, and it felt light. I don't understand, she said. That's a pretty thing. Is that your real hair? He asked. Yes, it's my hair. Do you think it's haunted? She asked. Probably not. No, it probably just has a charm on it. A ghost couldn't wear a real wig. I don't think it's haunted, he said. I'll try it on, she said. I bet it'll fit. Don't open it yet, he said. Just uh, hold it up to the light so you can see if it matches your hair. She did as he asked, and the watch was too big. It's too big, she said. It fits me, he said. Maybe you're not the right size. Maybe someone else should try it on, she said. No, I'm sure it fits, he said. Let me put it back in the box for now. You'll have to take it off when we get home, he said. One day when Nick came home, he saw his roommate, Tony, eating a pizza. Nick asked him what was up. This place is full of superbugs, said Tony. They are killing the people in the bathroom with their rubber ducks and eating their pizzas. I was going to call an exterminator, but figured we could handle it ourselves. It doesn't say this here, but by my accent you can tell that Tony's father was from Italy and his mother was from Transylvania. I might as well since work is finished, said Nick. Let me bring my camera along. The apartment was filled with superbugs. He had never seen anything like it. All the rooms were infested with the bugs. The couch was covered with them, and they were crawling all over the floor and walls. There were so many of them that they were literally covering every surface, and Nick couldn't see where he was going. He ran to the bathroom and looked at the sink. There was a rubber duck hanging by a string. A superbug crawled up and bit the string, and the duck fell into the sink. Then it jumped out and bit a bug in the sink. As the superbugs bit the rubber duck, they died. The rest of the bugs began to die as well. The last bug died, and the water in the sink became clear. A girl with long brown hair sat on the toilet seat and looked at Nick. I'm sorry I bit you, she said. I don't know what I was doing. She had beautiful green eyes, and her skin was pale and tan. Her name was Tiffany. It's okay, Nick said. It looks worse than it is. It'll go away in a few days. Thanks, she said. There was a lot of noise outside the door. It sounded like something was scratching at it, and that it was trying to get into the apartment. 
There was no doubt in her mind what it was. She approached the doorknob. As she turned it, the door flew open and a huge bug came running through it. She didn't even know it had gotten in until she saw it. The first thing that hit her was the smell. But that wasn't all. She took one look at the big thing with the long antenna and started screaming. The bug crawled towards her and she started screaming even louder. She ran to the window and threw it open. When she looked down, the ground was littered with dead people. She kept thinking to herself that she had better go downstairs and call someone, but she didn't know anyone that would care or listen to her. When she was sure that she was safe, she called 911 and waited for the police to arrive. A pizza delivery driver enters the building and heads up the stairs. On the fourth floor, he sees a rat running across his path. He gets the pizza out of the car and starts taking it up the stairs. He notices a dead bird on the steps. The next day, he takes the pizzas to the building where he lives. While taking the pizzas up the stairs, he sees a rat on the landing and knocks the pizzas off the box and onto the floor. The rats go into the apartments above and begin eating the pizzas and killing the tenants. It was the first week of October, and the moon was full. A young couple from London were camping in the country. It was midnight, and the girl was lying awake in bed, wondering what time it was. She looked at her wristwatch, but it had stopped. She got up and turned on the light. She saw something moving behind the curtains, so she grabbed her flashlight and went outside to check. She turned on the flashlight and shone it in the window. There was a figure sitting on the edge of the bed, and she screamed and ran back inside. Her boyfriend was fast asleep. She ran back outside again. There was no figure there. She got scared, so she went back into the bedroom and sat down on the edge of the bed again. Holding the flashlight between her knees, she saw some figure move into the corner. Again, it looked like a werewolf. She screamed again, and it took off running towards the woods. She followed it with her flashlight and kept trying to convince herself that it was only a tree branch. But she kept hearing sounds coming from the forest, and she kept thinking that she must be imagining things. The moon was full, and the werewolves could hear their prey's footsteps as they came closer to them. The wolves waited for their victims in the shadows of the woods, not far from the town. They could smell the blood of the humans. They could taste the flesh on their tongues. As the humans approached, suddenly the werewolves jumped out and attacked the humans, tearing them apart, eating them alive. The humans didn't stand a chance as they were eaten alive. It was only a matter of time before the werewolves were caught and killed by the police. The night was approaching and the family was getting ready for their party. They sat down at the table and mother asked the kids what they had been up to recently. Everyone started to tell their stories, but then father cut them off saying that they could talk about that later. Okay, I've got something to show you, he said, and went to his room. In a few moments, he came back carrying a big, bulky package and said, Take a look at this. The kids took turns unwrapping it and pulling out different items. There were clothes and hats and lots of other things. But at the bottom of the box was a Sasquatch. The kids were all surprised. That's not fair, said the oldest daughter. We never agreed to have a Sasquatch in our family. How can we have a Sasquatch dinner party? What kind of party is that? Her brother asked. The father smiled and said, It's a Sasquatch 
family dinner party. A drunk Wendigo stumbled across the boneless alien. It grabbed the drunk Wendigo by the head, but the drunk Wendigo punched the boneless alien. It felt like a knife going through its stomach. The drunk Wendigo grabbed the boneless alien's throat and squeezed. Its throat was crushed, and it was bleeding from its mouth. The drunk Wendigo was going to kill it, but the boneless alien's strength was too much. The boneless alien got away and took off into the woods. The Wendigo growled, You've got something that I want. The boneless alien said, Of course I do, but I'm not giving you anything. The Wendigo growled again. I want my family back. The boneless alien laughed. That's not how this works. The Wendigo growled. How does it work? The boneless alien said. You have to give me something. The Wendigo growled. What? The boneless alien said. Anything. The Wendigo growled. What do you want? The boneless alien said. I want you to help me find my family. The drunk Wendigo grabbed the boneless alien by its neck and squeezed. Its throat was crushed. The boneless alien cried out in pain and fell to the ground. And that's a wrap for Day 24, Horror Fam. I hope you enjoyed seeing what happens when AI writes horror. It's been a wild ride, but the scares won't stop here. Our Halloween countdown continues. So make sure you tune in tomorrow for even more spooky fun. And don't forget, most importantly, to take good care of yourselves, Horror Fam. <laughs>